my best to follow my God. <laughs> but here we go. And tonight I've been invited to discuss the Weaver's insights into two very significant community tapestries, Ave Avenue of Remembrance, which is the, tap the image is on the board. Can you turn this one? It was woven by us in 2015 for the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. And Morning Star, the tapestry on the loom behind me, which has been commissioned, as Michael said, for the new Sir John Monash Centre in Villers Bretonneux in France. I'll start by briefly discussing the parallels between the two tapestries, and then I'll concentrate on Morning Star and discuss our weaving processes. Okay. Both tapestries have been des designed by significant Australian artists. Immens Tillis is the artist of the Avenue of Remembrance. Lyndall Brown and Charles Green designed Morning Star. Lyndall and Charles have been Australian war artists in Afghanistan, Iraq and in Timor-Leste. As you may or know, or may not, um, the Australian Tapestry Workshop will only work with living artists so that a proper collaboration between the artists and the weavers can occur to create the interpretation of an artwork that is a standalone tapestry. Both tapestries are very large scale public works. Avenue of Remembrance is two and a half metres by three metres, and Morning Star is two and a half metres high by five metres wide. Both tapestries honour the contribution of Australian armed forces during World War I and commemorate the centenary of Anzac. Um, in the imagery of Avenue of Remembrance, Emmons Tillers painted a landscape reminiscent of wartime roads on the Western Front. Over this surface, he laid words, words from a letter Keith Murdoch wrote to the Australian Prime Minister Andrew Fisher in 1915, and words such as Gallipoli, Polygon Wood, Fromelles, Amiens, Villers, Bretonneau, names of the many places where Australian soldiers fought and were buried during World War I, and other emotive words Chance appears twice, bereft appeared three times, and by chance, Chris Kosius, one of our weavers, wove bereft each time, and by the third time, Chris was feeling bereft. <laughs> right. And remember, and remembrance as well. Remember was repeated four times. In Morning Star, Little Browns and Charles Green are dealing with the same issues in a completely different way. They've used a photoshopped image They've used a photoshopped image of the Australian bush. And this is a quote from the artist's statement. The overall image is storm light during winter, illuminating a pathway through eucalyptus trees and bush towards sunlight. The artists wanted to depict the world the young men left behind in Australia. They felt memories of the Australian bush would, be, would have been like heaven in their minds while they were battling through hell in northern France. Superimposed over this image on a horizontal and vertical axis are monochromatic photos, a combination of departures to war by ships from Australia, punctuated by visual comments. One photo represents a disproportionate number of young soldiers coming from rural Australia. The horizontal line of photos represent the horizontal line of photos represent the length of a tall man lying down, possibly representing death and departure. The vertical axis represents the height of a very tall man standing. The thin vertical line represents the soul leaving the body, and the Elgin marbles depict the aftermath of battle. Both tapestries parallel each other, and both are full of meaning and memories. And as weavers, because we are poring over every minute detail, the more we look into the imagery, the more we saw and were moved. So now I'm going to talk about the process of weaving the tapestry. We have five weavers on this. We have five weavers on this project. Chris Kosius, who's standing. Cheryl Thornton, who's sitting at the end there, <laughs> Jennifer Sharp and Leonie Bassange who aren't able to be here and myself and between us we all have many years of experience weaving as professional weavers at the workshop. We began this tapestry as we always begin tapestry commissions by weaving samples. 
The sampling process is when we make most of the decisions on how we will interpret the artwork. And that is the artwork. We've got other pieces, you know, pieces of the artwork around that we've had printed up in various ways, but that's, that was the artwork that was chosen for this piece. Um, this is where most of the collaboration between the artists and weavers occurred. During the two weeks we spent sampling, Lyndall and Charles visited the workshop regularly. The sampling process is when we decide our warp set. These are our warps, and we decide how fine or how coarse we're going to interpret the image. Um, we discuss the viewing distance and the scale of the tapestry. So this tapestry is going to be hanging above a doorway, a walkway, and the bottom of the tapestry is going to be hanging at the height of that bar. So no, you, you won't get a close view of the tapestry. We decide how much detail will be required. We decide how we interpret the colour and how extensive our colour palette will be. And by the end of the sampling process, we have to have determined an interpretive approach that will produce a strong, confident, successful tapestry which meets the time frame that we've been allowed. So it, it's important to determine the colour palette as quickly as possible so that we can get our orders for the wool we require to be dyed into Tony Stepanowski, our in-house chemist. And that's our dye room behind me. Um, and for the first few months of this project, we had colours continuously coming out of the colour laboratory. <coughs> oh, as I said, the tapestry is going to be hung quite high. So that's a bottom, so it's going to be another two and a half metres above that. So we decided we needed to use our coarsest warp set for this tapestry. We, um, to give the tapestry a strength and vitality it needed when it was being viewed from a distance. No one would be able to see it close up. We decided for all the photographs to try using the set palette of ten tones and in the end we used two sets of two palettes of eleven tones, a cooler range and a warmer range. So these are our samples over here. Okay. On the board over there are our samples. We, we spent two weeks sampling. So to decide our warp set, we really wanted a coarse warp set. So we've got the two samples that have got the, on the left hand top corner <coughs> are the same image repeated on different warp sets. And from a distance, we decided we couldn't tell any difference, so we went with the coarse all upset. One of the, the other problem we had, or that was going to decide which warp set we chose, was <coughs> how we could interpret the faces of the three men, the, the three men representing the rural young men going off to war. So we needed, enough we needed enough warps to be able to weave their faces. But we still felt the viewing distance was so far that it, they read, read, read well from a distance. And so with the colour palettes we used, the top row of samples <coughs> are all our cooler palette. And the sample of the Elgin marbles, the drapery in the Elgin marbles, is the warmer palette we used. There's another sample beside that with a browner palette, which we chose not to use. For the landscape, we spent time deciding in discussion with Lyndall and Charles the darkest tones and where they were. So we decided the darkest tone in the tapestry is that tree, the big dark tree in the middle. Um, the lightest tone and where that was, so the lightest tones are beside that. Um, we decided how reduced the palette needed to be and we discussed introducing small amounts of shiny lurex which <laughs> to represent the dewy cobwebs glistening in the dawn light. And you can see <coughs> it's just little bits of lurex and we hope that if the sun hits the tapestry they'll glisten. Once we had established our approach, we made the cartoon. So we, this image is so small, we had a, another image, a bigger image blown up, which is on the board behind the samples. 
And over the top of that we place the acetate sheet and we do a line drawing which then gets blown up and becomes a cartoon for the tapestry and you can see that's our cartoon. So the line drawing is where we do and a lot of interpretation happens. Chris did the line drawing for the background for the landscape and I did the line drawing for the photographs and you have to just reduce the imagery, you have to get all the structure you need into the line drawing and but not too much information because we have to be able to read it on the warps. <laughs> if you have too much information you can't see anything. So you can go up and have a close look at that later. Once we'd established our approach, we made the cartoon, warped up the loom, inked the cartoon onto the warps. So the cartoon gets pressed up to the warps and we ink the, we ink the image on. And it gives us a guide to keep the scale of the tapestry right. That's really good. Um, and then we begin weaving. So at the end of last week, we've woven 85% of the tapestry. We hope to finish the tapestry by the end of the first week in December. We start weaving the well, this piece, we're weaving it from bottom to top. So we started from the bottom and we weave up. And every few weeks we get to a height like this. Well, this is very high because we wanted you all to be able to see as much tapestry as you could see. But it then gets rolled down. So you lose, the image disappears. So we, we can't wait to see the tapestry finished and rolled up so we get to see the whole completed image. We do take photographs all the way through and we keep our bobbins so that we have references to the colour, but it, it's exciting. We're looking forward to seeing it rolled up. Okay, so I'd like to say thank you to my wonderful team of weavers and to the whole Australian Tapestry Workshop, to the Foundation, the Board, the Administrative Staff, the Friends of the Workshop, and to everyone who has made this tapestry possible. Thank you. Thank you.